uh, with the Environmental Board and the Development Commission tonight. Uh, due to the virtual format of today's meeting, I'd like to start by providing some basic guidelines. We have participants attending by computer and others who may be attending by phone. For all meeting attendees who wish to speak, please speak clearly and pause frequently. State your name each time before speaking. Mute your microphone when not speaking. And if you have technical issues, try joining the meeting using a different device, such as a smartphone or tablet, or use the call-in information in the meeting invite to call into the meeting. Uh, now we'll go ahead and, and go into attendance. Uh, Stefan, will you please go ahead and call uh, attendance for Policy and Planning Commission? Yes, Commissioner Maligan. Here. Commissioner Lewis. Commissioner Monahan. Commissioner Boyce. Here. Commissioner Fowle. Here. Commissioner Bader. Here. And Commissioner Zaragoza. Chair Paul, you have a quorum tonight. Excellent. Thank you. Okay, uh, I'm going to go ahead and go into um, some parameters for tonight. Uh, the public hearing is for Title 18 landscape and open space updates. Uh, this part of the agenda will have several parts to it, which will start with presentations on each topic. After each presentation, we will open the floor only to clarifying questions uh, from all board commission members. Please reserve comments for, del for the deliberations. Um, we are going to be short on time tonight, so I want to emphasize that uh, we only ask questions during the question time and reserve comments for deliberation. Then we'll be opening up to public comments before the Park and Environmental Board deliberations. Um, the Park Board Chair uh, will go ahead and uh, facilitate the discussion. Park Board, Stephen, are you? Park Board or Environmental Board? Environmental um, Board. Chair, Chair Book will be facilitating the deliberation discussions. Oh, okay. From the, from the Park Board. Very good. I will facilitate uh, tonight's discussions and encourage feedback from board members. For each deliberation, I ask that the Planning Policy Commission members mute themselves and turn off their cameras. Once each topic of the deliberation is concluded, we'll move through the remaining topics at the same in the same order. Uh, before the public hearing is closed. PPC will deliberate on these topics at the April 14th meeting. After some discussions with staff, I've asked that we switch up the topics to be presented and we'll start with the community open space uh, and, the commu and the green necklace and then the tree preservation and the, we will conclude with the landscape and open space. There's a lot of information to be covered tonight and I will do my best to make sure we are adjourned by 8.30 tonight. If it looks like we're going to go over, I will ask the city to continue the discussion in a future meeting. Um, so staff, uh, please go ahead with your first presentation tonight. Tonight we are starting with Dan Martinez or uh, with uh, our consultant Katie. Who uh, go ahead and sh start share your screen Katie. Thank you, Stephen. Um, and thank you all for being here on this beautiful evening. You have lots of other things you could be doing, so thank you for giving your time to this important topic. Um, I'm going to be talking about the Community Space and Green Necklace Chapter First. This was a chapter that was created um, to fulfill the Goal 11, um, which wanted to implement elements of the Park Strategic Plan and Green Necklace vision through the Land Use Code. Um, this chapter also combines uh, existing standards for um, uh, for open for what was called open space for amenity space um, community spaces in um, Title 18 in the Issaquah and Talus replacement regulations and in um, the Central Issaquah Design and Development Standards. There's also some elements of uh, the park strategic plan that we've incorporated into this chapter, um, some developer obligations that were in the central Issaquah plan, and some elements of the um, urban design manual from the central Issaquah design and development standards. Uh, in general, we were trying to create a consolidated place for all of these um, standards that have to do with 
uh, developer built amenity and open natural areas uh, throughout the city. And it was not the intent to create a chapter that would guide the activities of the parks department, but rather um, reflecting the obligations of developers in contributing toward the green necklace. So the key changes um, and, and changes are really, well, the key changes here, we introduced some new terms. Um, there was some confusion that I saw coming through in the public comments, so I just wanted to clarify those now. Um, in the existing code and um, in some places in the park strategic, strategic plan, the term open space is used. And uh, for the parks plan, open space is referring to um, natural area that's unplanned and that isn't really intended to be used for active recreation. Um, the term open space in the land use code was used to refer to areas that may be provided at a development uh, for people to use and for recreation and enjoyment. So because those two terms conflicted in meaning, um, we established three different um, terms for what used to be called open space. So uh, natural area that's provided by a developer is now called natural amenity area. Um, if that amenity area is located inside, it's just called an amenity area. And then there's a third category called community space. And that uh, came from the central Issaquah plan and it's uh, a particular type of natural amenity area that's intended to be open to the public. So natural amenity areas for other developments are intended for the residents of, of the housing development and not for the general public, but community space is intended for the general public. Um, and so the chapter includes um, also a new way of regulating space to implement the green necklace by um, adding new requirements for developments that are adjacent to parks or open spaces or um, city owned trails or the, a new a concept called shared use routes, uh, which existed in the central plan, but is new now applied citywide. Um, on. So again, here's a summary of those terms. The community space is intended for public use. Natural amenity areas are open space, but they're, use, they're intended for use by residents. Um, and the indoor amenities, obviously indoor and building orientation or connection is this new approach to uh, green necklace implementation. So part of the code includes a new map. Uh, this is uh, taken from the park strategic plan and simplified for the land use code. Uh, it shows the trail, the city owned trails, the green necklace trails and the parks and open spaces that the parks uh, department indicated they wanted to, um, they wanted development to be oriented to these facilities. So uh, in reviewing the comments so far, um, we've heard that there's needs to be some clarity about these different types of space, community space versus other space. Um, and to the extent that we need to add clarity, we'll make sure to do that in the draft moving forward. Um, there's questions whether this chapter applied to parks and um, facilities that the city would be developing. And the answer is no, this just applies to uh, developer built amenities. And then um, there was a specific question about the natural context zone. And I just quickly wanted to touch on that because it's a similar idea um, to this new building orientation code that we have. Uh, the urban design manual required certain development along critical areas to orient toward those critical areas. And uh, this code isn't meant to replace that, uh, but that the natural context regulations actually currently are in the building chapter. So we're looking at whether it makes more sense to move those into this chapter instead. Um, some more comments, there was questions about how um, space was applied to residential buildings. I'm not gonna go into that too much here, but I'm happy to answer questions. Um, but essentially, I think that there may be, have been some confusion over um, what natural amenity requirements there were for larger buildings. And essentially it's it's not less, it's the same, and they have to do an extra step um, if they're in central Issaquah. And uh, 
So I wanted to quickly show this example um, of how the new code would be applied to a site in Issaquah. So this is um, this is on Holly Street. It's adjacent to Bernston Park, located in central Issaquah, and it's located along a through block passage, which is down here at the bottom. Um, it's six residential units. So this is a this is a so under the new code, since it's a, located adjacent to a park, which is on that green necklace map, the development would be required to orient in, in some way by having windows or entries to face that um, park, and they would be required to locate their natural amenity area in that same area between the building and the park. They also would be required to connect to this through block passage, which provides um, an access to the park. So that connection would have to come somewhere in the development so that that would be an easy way to facilitate access to the park. Uh, if this were a larger building, it was 22 units or more, it would also have to do an, an additional amenity. Um, and if it were a senior living or assisted living community, there would be additional indoor amenity space requirements. Um, if it were a commercial or mixed use in central Issaquah, they would also need to build a public community space. So um, our next steps for this code, uh, we're, we'll do a close review for any internal inconsistencies um, and make sure it's organized clearly. Um, we may be adding those standards for the natural context zone from the urban design manual into this chapter. And then we may continue to work on adding detail or clarification to that green necklace map to make it easier um, to use and clear and clarify which sites it applies to. Thank you, Planner Cody. And so we'll go, we'll go ahead and open up to questions, but before we start, um, we need to back up for a second. And Stephen, we need to call roll call for the other boards on this uh, call tonight. So, uh, Stephen, would you like to go ahead and take care of that? Yes, Chair Fall. Uh, we'll start with the Park Board with uh, Chair Book. Hi, this is uh, Park Board Chair Brad Book. I'm going to call roll call for the Park Board attendees that we have this evening. Please um, take yourself off mute and acknowledge your presence when I call your name. Uh, Danielle Givens. Present. Uh, Jonathan Richardson. Present. Uh, that concludes Park Board, uh, Ron, of attendees. Do you want me to also do this for the Environmental Board as well? Uh, no, that's okay, uh, Chair Book. We're going to go to uh, staff, Stacy, to do the roll call for the Environmental Board. Thank you. Okay. Thanks, Stephen. <clears throat> um, for the Environmental Board, I'll go ahead and call roll. Uh, Danny Maiden. Don McWilliams. Yep, present. Rishi Hazra has an excused absence. Cameron Fisher has an excused absence. Laura Labeco has excused absence. Uh, Nancy Davidson. Here. Dan Hintz. Here. Ann Newcomb, uh, she'll be joining us about seven o'clock. Uh, Jamie Finch has an excused absence. Uh, Tom Anderson. Here. Uh, Surya Bala Pragada and Janet Wall. That's it for the environmental board. Okay, thank you. All right, now for questions and how we're going to handle this because we have two boards tonight, um, actually three boards. So if you have questions, please post that you have a question in the chat. You don't need to post the actual question, just post that you have a question um, and we'll go ahead and call on you. Um, so let's go ahead and open it up for commissioner questions and give it a moment here. Someone has to have a question. And we have Nancy Davidson. She's the first person for a question tonight. So. Thank you very much. Um, my question kind of ties to how this interacts or relates to the other sections that we're talking about tonight. 
particularly, particularly um, I'm looking at the example that was provided in terms of how it ties to retaining trees and other aspects of the code. It seems like this appears to be kind of an isolated piece of code that hasn't taken into the community goals of retaining landscaping, doing the um, retaining, retaining tree canopies, um, maintaining um, existing mature trees. So how do we make sure that that provision as we're adopting community and amenity spaces, that we're trying to get those focused on protecting the um, community assets that we have in place at this time. Did I answer the questions right after there? Commissioner Paul. Yes, Katie, uh, go ahead and okay. answer the questions after the commissioners ask. Okay, thank you. Um, so this, this would build on all of the other sections of the code. So if we take that example that I was showing you before, um, I didn't highlight the trees. There were some trees located on the edges of the property, but the, the development proposal would be required to show how it's meeting the tree retention and preservation code and how it's meeting the landscape code and how it's meeting the community spaces code in addition to any building standards and um, form and intensity standards. So it's not, this code would be would be required for all projects of five or more units um, and non-residential and multifamily buildings in central Issaquah. So it, it would be one of many um, standards that planners would look at when evaluating a proposal. Can I ask one follow-up question to what you responded to me on? And that is, you said it was Central Issaquah, but this would be throughout the city, correct? So the chapter applies throughout the city and it's um, the way that existing code right now works. Um, they There are not um, natural amenity standards for non-residential buildings, except for Central Issaquah and in the urban villages. So those would remain the same and at this point, we're not expanding those natural amenity requirements to non-residential and mixed use developments outside of central, um, but there's currently natural amenity standards for residential uses all over the city, and that would, that would stay the same. So how are we creating a consistent code if we're not applying this code of natural amenity spaces throughout the city of Issaquah if it's only focused on central Issaquah? Well, the the aspect that is being um, applied citywide are these green necklace provisions. So those would those would apply outside and inside Central Issaquah. So any properties that are uh, located along trails or parks would be required to provide orientation and in some cases connection to those facilities. Uh, I think that it's a policy decision whether to require non-residential. So for example, a retail use like a grocery store outside of Central Issaquah doesn't need to provide an amenity space right now. That That's the way the code currently is. Um, so if the city wanted to change that, that would that would be an option, but that's just not how the code currently is. And, and it wasn't um, changed in this draft either. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Commissioner uh, Davidson and Commissioner Anderson. You have the floor. Oh, uh, yes, thank you, Tom Anderson here. Um, I'm wondering, is there any part of this provision that would provide an incentive for existing developments uh, to provide improved trail access? Uh, I didn't see anything in there, but I'm just wondering if there's something I, I missed in that. I'm, I'm thinking in terms of like here in the south end of town, there are some major multifamily apartment building uh, and complexes that uh, in their backyard is the Rainier Trail, you know, a great resource. And uh, well, humans have found access there, but it's very haphazard and it, it would be nice for it to be better aligned with these things. Well, it's not going to be redeveloped uh, and uh, it's not a new development. Is there any way that we can provide some incentive uh, to existing developments to um, improve this access to this uh, uh, tremendous uh, uh, green ne necklace um, trail resources that we have? 
So the short answer is no, there are not incentives to add connections to existing development. That would, um, that would likely be a program that would be located outside of the land use code through the parks department or some other uh, city program. Um, the only the only actions that the land use code uh, controls or is applicable 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 to is development and redevelopment and subdivision activities. So um, there would need to be a different tool created, I guess, is what I'm saying. If if an incentive program was was needed to be established. Okay, thank you. Thank you, uh, Commissioner Anderson and Commissioner Milligan. You have the floor. Thank you, Chair Fall. Nina Milligan here. I wanted to ask about the uh, offset for community space by rooftop amenities, um, especially um, going through the definitions that you provided earlier that uh, amenities are for private use and community space is for public use. Um, I, I don't understand why that would happen. And is that from old code or is there a way to make that more consistent with the definitions to keep community spaces open to the public? Are you wondering specifically whether rooftop community space is open to the public? Uh, no, I saw that there was a um, that some rooftop amenity space can count against your requirement for community space. Okay, and uh, that didn't seem um, to make sense to me since they're two different things and they're serving two different needs. Thank you. So for the the rooftop amenity space. Uh, that's allowed to count as community space. Again, the community space is intended for public use. Um, that would be, it would, if it was rooftop space, it would still be required to be open to the public. So it could be a, a restaurant that has a rooftop area. It could be a view platform or viewpoint. Um, it wouldn't be able to be private to that building unless they were using it to fulfill a natural amenity area that was part of their um, residential requirement or just on their own, by their own choice. Um, but in order to fulfill the community space obligation, it would need to be open to the public. And also if they do provide community space as a rooftop amenity, they can't fulfill all of their obligations through the rooftop. They also have to have some at ground level. Okay, thank you, Commissioner Milligan. And we're gonna move on to Commissioner Voice. You have the floor. Thank you, Chair Fell. Am I pronouncing your last name right, Ms. Cody? Cody, yes. Okay, hi, Ms. Cody. Um, a few questions real quickly. Under exceptions, it writes that this chapter does not apply to residential development, redevelopment, or subdivision of four or fewer units. Um, we've had recent conversations about possibly enlarging a short plat from four to nine would that accept would that exception also carry over if we were to move short plats from four units to nine units well um the reason that we used the four unit threshold was to remain consistent with the um one of the reasons was to remain consistent with that short plat threshold um in the current draft of the subdivision chapter which you haven't seen yet but it's coming your way soon um we've we've kept the threshold at five. Um, that was based on direction from the PPC. So we haven't increased it to nine units. Uh, and I think that if, that the intent of, of choosing that number um, was four fewer units, uh, the scale of that development still, it still makes sense to have um, the, the natural amenity area be provided through setbacks and um, other uh, uh, lot coverage and other standards that can achieve those. Um, but it would, I think we would need to have a, a discussion if, if that short plotting uh, level was increased um, because it, it would, I think it's important to have some standards for when you get into larger unit developments. Sure, yeah, no, I agree. Uh, just kind of wondering where the number four came from. And, and again, I know we're having some discussions about that. Uh, question number two, real quickly, is it says also, and I believe this is on page nine of 19, um, C, 
1A, the development must be oriented is page 11, 19. Um, under section two, it also says the facility selected must be appropriate for the target housing market segment. Um, happy to see this, but how do we differ from brand new development, brand new condos from let's say a nursing home? What's the definition? Who decides what that target segment is? That's a that's a good question. The the intent of that standard was trying to recognize that different uh, different populations have different recreational needs or desires, and so it would be incumbent on uh, the developer, I suppose, in conversation with the city, to determine what would be appropriate. Probably, if they're building units that are two and three bedroom units, that suggests there could be families. Perhaps not always, but it, you know, that's a possibility. Um, so playground equipment or some some open space for for playing would be appropriate. Whereas if they're all studios, that's more likely to be, you know, in individuals or couples. And so that may indicate a different type of amenity. But I think uh, we we didn't want to try to guess all of the possible combinations of populations and amenities, uh, just that it should there should be some reason and it should match what their intended um, tenancy or, or users would be. Right, a nursing home, you could find probably uh, play school things and gyms, both, so great, thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Voice. And so I'm not seeing any additional questions. So from there, uh, Stephen, let's go ahead and open it up for uh, public comment. And we need to keep the, uh, there is a time limit of no more than five minutes. So Stephen, is anyone signed up for public comment on this topic tonight? Uh, no one signed up beforehand. And so I'm checking if anybody has raised their hands on the attendance list. And I'm not seeing any raised hands, um, but we can give them a minute. Okay, I see uh, raised hands with Connie Marsh, so and then Mary Lynch. So Connie, I'm gonna start with you. I'm gonna unmute you now and make you a panelist. So you should show up in just a second. Okay, we see you. Hey, sort of be interesting. I, I couldn't raise my hand, so I don't know why. Um, Connie Marsh, I live on Squawk Mountain, and the natural context zone being incorporated could address some of my concerns with that, uh, more critical area connections. Um, the language is, is not clear in the code, so I'm assuming that that is going to be wrapped up. So I'm going to focus on private parks that are basically deed restricted to be parks yet they are going to have redevelopment around them so i think what i'm going to do is i'm going to focus on the rowley park that's right there sort of off of mall street and it's just this little green space in the middle of central issaquah and my recollection is it is part of their development agreement and so uh it makes sense to me that if you are going to be developing around that, because that's not all their property around it, that you would also have to address that park as if it were a park park, because it is a private green space for people to be able to enjoy and use and if everyone around it turns their back to it and it's just blank walls going over the little park that will that will harm the park so uh the idea of this private dedicated green space and how you're going to redevelop around it is is not at all addressed here the green uh necklace map in the park strategic plan is not the map that you're using and calling a green necklace that map is pretty well dedicated to the valley floor and this conflict is confusing because you are taking the green necklace concept and spreading it all over the city 
when originally it has just been in the central Issaquah area. And with that conflict, it, it uh, I think it's going to be hard to implement and enforce because everybody is thinking of different things. So I would use a different term for the citywide uh, method of, of dealing with parks. And then I would focus down on the central Issaquah plan area and just call that the green necklace. That way you don't have to change your park strategic plan and you would still be consistent. And so then the last thing is you are uh, allowing your natural amenity space to be private balconies. And um, I'm saying, no, I don't think private amenity space, natural amenity space should be private balconies on the outsides of buildings. If you look at the description of why you have it, there's a definitely a sociable context and unless people are singing opera off their balconies regularly in Issaquah, I just don't think that you're getting this sociability factor that you are looking for. So you might be able to require, the, require those in the building section, but uh, I don't would not allow them here. Thank you. Okay, I see that Mary Lynch has signed up, so I'm going to unmute you now and make you a panelist. Hi, this is Mary Lynch. I just wanted to comment. I'm a, it's a little bit frustrating. Um, I don't know if you're aware of this meeting is not live as promised on either channel 21 or live streaming. And it took me again 20 minutes to get into the meeting tonight. So I was a little bit worried that there wasn't any public or the public comment had already started. But I think it's advertised that these meetings are going to be on these websites and TV channels. They ought to be there or some notice ought to go up to let people know how they can get in. That's just just a comment. That's it. Thank you. Chair Hall, I don't see any other raised hands for public comment. All right, and thank you very much. So we'll go ahead and we're going to leave public comment open until the end of the meeting. Um, and we're going to move now into uh, deliberations. So with that, um, the park board is going to chair the deliberations. And during this time, PPC will go ahead and mute and turn off their cameras. Thanks, Commissioner Fall. Um, this is Brad Book from the Park Board. So, if you could um, put into everyone as the drop down, if you have a question or a comment, please uh, put that in the chat and I will call upon you in order. And this applies both to the Park Board and the Environmental Board. So we have a comment uh, from Nancy Davidson. Please go ahead. Hi, Nancy Davidson with the Environmental Board. Um, my comment is um, kind of looking at the purpose of this section, which is more than implementation of the green necklace, but it is more to have an urban environment that's saturated with an array of green elements. It seems to me Issaquah is in an urban community and we need to focus on providing these kinds of amenities at areas outside of just the central Issaquah area. We should be thinking about how the whole community develops and what kind of green spaces and areas to gather we have that are not just in central Issaquah because the city is gonna change over time and these spaces will be gone as we continue to redevelop. And so I would encourage us to talk to the city council and ask them if we really wanna change the policy to go further than just the central Issaquah area and really try and focus us on the whole community of Issaquah from South Cove all the way up to areas around Providence Point so that we are basically including the whole community as we try and thinking about making it a greener community, making it a more inviting community and really think about doing this throughout the whole city. That's my comment. Thank you. Thank you, Nancy. Uh, next, we have comments from uh, the Park Board, uh, Danielle Givens. Uh, go ahead, Danielle. 
Thanks. Um, I have a few comments. Um, one with respect to, and these are kind of scattered about in the in the um, proposed code. Um, with respect to rooftops, um, I saw some language that that delineated what some types of activities or amenities that would count uh, or would be permitted on rooftops, um, but I didn't see anything with respect to um, like active recreation or fields. And that is something, especially if it was going to be open for the community use, um, that I would like to make sure that that would be permitted. Um, there are fields on top of schools, um, for example, in Seattle. Um, and that is something that we might, you know, we, we may want because we have a, a deficit of flat um, open land. Um, another, um, I also felt like um, in the section that we talked about general general amenities, so this was in uh, Article 2, um, there were some notes that this was brought forth from the Assisted Living and Senior Housing Standards. And um, as a result, to me, it felt like these requirements as far as minimum size and landscaping did not really apply or or needed to be you know modified in some way um, for areas where there would be kids and families. So I would just encourage um, like a little bit of a deeper look at that article to make sure that we're not limiting what goes in um, because of where the language came from. And um, let's see the plaza. Um, the plaza language, um, which was, sorry, um, well, I can't find the plaza language, but in the plaza language, um, there is some, um, requirements about kind of what that what the maintenance requirements would be and I would really like to see there be a requirement for um, like snow removal and um, dealing with ice um, and that that type of winter weather um, on plazas I did not see that in there at currently um, and I guess I have just kind of a general question. There are, were some areas in the code, in this draft that um, where I saw some inconsistencies or some missing language and whatnot, and I was just wondering what the best, like I don't want to deal with that on this call um, because there are more specific questions, but who would be the best person to, um, for me to provide those to? Thanks. Uh, thanks, Danielle. Um... I'm not seeing any other questions or comments uh, posted on the chat at this time. I would like to welcome you to, if you do have additional comments or questions, you can submit those to staff or the PPC uh, for further follow-up. And that might apply to you, Danielle, in regards to your uh, inquiry. Uh, so that includes um, the discussion from the Park Board and um, Environmental Board at this time. Okay, and thank you, Chair Book. And with that, I'm going to go ahead and bring this back over to Stephen uh, for staff to go ahead and continue with the next topic. Thank you, Chair Paul. Now we're going to go to Dan Martinez, and I'm going to give him presenting rights now. So, Dan, go ahead and share your screen when you're ready, and um, sure. he's going to move on to the presentation. Thank you. All right, can we all all see this? Not yet. Yes. How about now? Great. All right, so let's talk trees and I apologize ahead of time. I've had a sinus infection. Um, so my throat's a little dry. 
Um, so I want to start by talking a little bit about the approach that we were asked to take. Um, this consisted of uh, nine different um, tasks, if you will. Um, we've, we were asked to separate the landscaping and tree preservation codes out. We've done that. And uh, more importantly, what we did was combine the different sections of code um, that we have. Currently, we have tree regulations uh, scattered in various places, uh, the municipal code, the old town standards, and then we also have them in the central Issaquah standards. So um, importantly, we've combined all of those into one, hopefully make it more intuitive uh, for both staff and applicants. Um, we've adopted a tree canopy approach. Um, the recommendation was to use land use um, zoning, but we've gone with planning sub areas and, and I'll get into that in um, some subsequent slides. Um, apply right tree, right place method. We believe we've addressed this uh, by expanding the opportunity to uh, plant off-site and pay fee in lieu where it was previously only allowed for development and redevelopment. It's, it's now available for single family residences, multifamily and uh, commercial properties. We've also enhanced our replacement tree regulations. Um, for example, by uh, requiring, for, so for example, by requiring tree replacement in situations where it was previously not required. Um, this should hopefully address uh, concerns about losing canopy over time. Um, it wasn't very intuitive in the code that uh, arborist credentials needed to be um, clear and spelled out. We hope we've addressed this with, with the current code. Um, we've adjusted the language um, for the city tree fund and, and we recognize that there's more work to do there um, and that establishing receiving sites is going to be critical to the success of the the tree fund. Um, tree value, we previously didn't have a mechanism for this. Uh, we've adopted, we are proposing to adopt the cost approach and the trunk formula method. Uh, update the tree list. This is now incorporated into code. The work of updating the tree list is uh, another task, but uh, currently just putting it into code was important. Uh, it wasn't previously, and so it was diff difficult to implement because um, it was largely seen as um, voluntary. Um, develop more rigorous application and review process to landmark trees. This has largely stayed the same. Um, and that's because right now, in order to remove a landmark tree, and that's a tree that's considered 30 inches decibel um, at diameter at breast height um, or greater, uh, right now, to remove a tree that is a landmark tree, it must be a hazard tree, and that can only be determined by a um, certified arborist trained in that uh, assessment. And then finally, uh, to establish a designation for exceptional trees. We've opted not to pursue this. Uh, we looked at exceptional tree regulations in other cities, and they look very much um, like what our heritage trees um, look like in our current code. 
the the thing about our heritage trees is that there are no regulations in our code they're they're mentioned and there's uh, seemingly a heritage tree program um, but it's not in code and so that's that's one of the um, topics for discussion for tonight hopefully As for major changes in the code, I'm gonna discuss some of the major changes and then uh, towards the end discuss, just highlight some of the other changes, but major changes include this, the adoption of the tree canopy uh, coverage goals. Uh, this entirely replaces the minimum tree density in our existing code. And then we have um, proposed a variance procedure to replace our administrative adjustment of standards process. So um, this tree canopy coverage has, has, has been probably the biggest thing that we've done with the code, and it's definitely raised the most questions. Um, so, you know, I have three specific topics that I'm really hoping that the commissions discuss tonight, and this canopy coverage is one of them. Um, I mentioned that this replaces our minimum tree density requirements, um, and in our existing code, um, it requires a prescribed number of trees, for example, 19 trees for a 23,000 square foot community facility site. So it's very prescriptive um, based on lot size and land use. Um, we're, we're hopeful that tree canopy coverage requirements will offer an improved tool um, to to allow the city to maintain and enhance canopy coverage um, while being cognizant of the limitations on tree planning and future development. Um, so I mentioned earlier that in the, the gap analysis memo, um recommended the use of land use designations um we opted not to use this uh this is because this is largely based on the urban tree canopy assessment that the city had done in 2019 it um has these very broad uh, zoning designation, single family with no distinction in lot sizes, multifamily. Um, there was even a residential uh, category, which primarily we found out primarily consists of the rally DA area. Um, so after much discussion, we determined that planning sub areas should be used because they might allow for more nuance and might help existing areas retain their uh, distinct characters. For, for example, um, we see that the urban tree canopy percentage in Old Town is currently 32%, uh, while in Tiger Mountain, it's 91%. Uh, we don't feel that it would be fair um, to create a blanket regulation that says, uh, single family properties in Old Town have to do exactly the same thing that single family properties in Tiger Mountain are doing. So we are hopeful that this will be a um, good, good approach. Um, as, as part of this effort, uh, one of the things that I did was uh, I reached out to a development review arborist at the city of Lake Forest Park. Um, Lake Forest Park is one of the cities we were asked to look at because they currently use tree canopy coverage in their code. Um, so I spoke with their um, arborist on staff 
and she uh, absolutely recommended canopy over minimum tree density based on her own experiences. But one of the things that I thought was interesting about what she explained was that um, we should also be uh, focusing on enhancing tree retention. And so we've done that in the code as well. Um, a rigid formula was not used. We, we had to exercise some discretion um, and arrived at these proposed 30-year targets by taking existing tree canopy, uh, possible planting area, our very high level understanding of fire breaks, um, and then coming up with some numbers. Um, at the Parks Board meeting, I, I provided a very small example of what it would look like in practice on one site. Um, I spoke with one of our residents who mentioned she didn't find that very helpful and that may be just a comparison side by side of what's um, in the urban tree canopy assessment, which is this table in blue. Um, and it's these percentages. And she wanted to see what it might look like um, with the proposed targets. So, for example, um, Central Issaquah has a currently has an urban tree canopy of 27%, uh, with a possible planting area of 15%. Uh, so the canopy coverage that we're proposing um, while also recognizing that central is a cause where we're directing a, our, a lot of our growth is um, we've decided on 35 percent and we took each planning sub area and uh, arrived at figures based on their geography and topography and just our understanding of the applicable uh, development regulations in, in those areas. Uh, we received a lot of uh, comments with, excuse me. We received a lot of comments asking about what tools the city intends to use to measure canopy. Um, we, the, the expectation is going to be that for large development projects, development, redevelopment, we're going to ask uh, that the applicant prepare, have a arborist prepare the projections uh, for our standard tree removal permit reviews um where it's you know existing single family multi-family commercial property owners uh will be doing a lot of the measuring ourselves and we can use uh the city's gis uh king county imap google maps and uh there are several um programs out there such as tree plotter So we adopted a variance process, and this eliminates our administrative adjustment of standards process. The, the language in that process um, can be vague. It can be very difficult to evenly implement. So we've adopted um, this, uh, this variance process. It's based, based largely on ex existing procedures used in Redmond and Sammamish, and it, it is um, a little more rigorous, um, but it also allows us to have a tool um, that can help us address some challenges. Um, there are several instances recently where having this variance process now would be really helpful. Some of the other changes, we've eliminated the tree removal notification form 
and now will require that all tree removal be approved under a tree removal permit. The reason we've done this is that there's been a lot of confusion with the tree removal notification form. Um, folks will submit it thinking that they don't need a permit. Very often the notification form um, is not the right form to use and a permit's required either because it's a landmark tree or it's a tree within a critical area. Um, so we wanted to remove that confusion and just process everything under one permit type. Um, we've eliminated max tree removal on developed properties. Uh, the current code allows um, develop lots uh, based on their size to remove a maximum number of trees without any kind of permit. Uh, we want to be able to account for tree replanting. Um, so everything now, again, is going to require a, a tree removal permit. Um, we've increased our tree retention from 30% to 35% in single family zoning, and that's just one example. Um, we've, um, we're proposing some changes to our replacement trees uh, regulations, and then we've consolidated various exemptions into one section that were previously just kind of scattered throughout the code. So in my, in the draft, in the memo that I prepared, um, I identified tree canopy coverage targets and heritage trees it's, as two uh, discussion items. But after reading a lot of the comments and questions that came in from the public, um, I think an important discussion is going to be tracking mechanisms. The question has been, okay, so how are we going to know, um, how does the city know which trees have been removed, how many trees have been replaced, what can we expect our canopy coverage to be? Um, we don't have answers to that because we currently aren't proposing a tracking mechanism. Uh, so after receiving several questions about this, it, it, it seems like it's an important um, conversation to have. And that is all for my presentation. All right, and thank you very much, uh, Planner Martinez. And so we're going to go ahead and open this up to uh, commissioner questions. And while we're waiting for commissioner questions, I'm going to fire off a question for you. Um, so <clears throat> looking at, I'm going to use Squawk Mountain as an example, uh, canopy coverage 45%. How are you calculating canopy coverage of 45%? Is that per lot or is that the mountain? regional area itself? The can canopy coverage goal would be applied on a per lot basis. Um, and um, it's it would be the same for, I understand there's not commercial up in Squawk Mountain, but the these goals apply evenly to commercial multifamily, single family lots. Um, so with Squawk Mountain, uh, if the goal is 45%, then the expectation would be that um, either existing, um, a combination of existing and replanted trees uh, would meet that 45% uh, coverage. Currently, um, Squawk Mountain has 63%, and that's just across uh, that planting sub area. Uh, there's also possible planting area of 17%, um, but we've gone with 45% recognizing that uh, there is, we need to make um, some concessions in for the sake of wildfire safety. Okay, so 45% is the 
goal, 65% is the current standard, correct? Correct. So in some areas, there are, we are uh, increase, we are hoping to increase the canopy coverage and in other areas like Tiger Mountain and Squawk Mountain, we recognize uh, that because we are dealing with multiple land uses and because we are also cognizant of uh, wildfire risk, there are some areas that the um, where the canopy coverage is actually proposed to be reduced. Okay, I don't know that I agree with that, but um, I appreciate that. Uh, so my next question is dealing with, I have inside knowledge that there are two five acre parcels down on the bottom of Squawk Mountain near Mine Hill Road that may be developed. They are fully treed. So there's probably several hundred trees on there. And your proposal is that they would, the, a developer would be able to go in and actually remove every single tree. And if oh, they absolutely. put a tree, if they put absolutely a tree, not, no. Okay. No, um, we have our tree retention requirements. Um, and if that developer were proposing to build uh, residential units, they would be required to retain 35% of the total caliper um, of inches in, at diameter breast height. Okay. Okay. Because if they remove the trees, they're going to put in plum trees or other small trees, fruit trees, and so on, which is not a dug fir. And a dug fir is a significant carbon sink for our community, especially as we have more traffic and more people move in. So that was my fear. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Uh, looks like we have, I'm going to move on to other questions here. So we have questions from Commissioner Heights. You have the floor. Thank you. Uh, yeah, Dan Hintz here. Um, Daniel, thank you for the presentation. I, I, I guess on a high level, I would like to hear just a little bit more how the um, possible planting areas were determined. And then I guess I'm specifically curious with the um, the uh, tree fund or in lieu of fund, um, you know, what are some of the mechanisms to, uh, you know, if a, if a tree is, you know, lost from one property, I, I guess, you know, I, I'm struggling to see, you know, on other private properties, how trees would go in. I mean, is it just going to focus more concentration of tree planting on, you know, public right of ways and city parks? Um, I'm just kind of curious how you foresee some of those um, in lieu kind of tree funds being used in those potential planting areas and some of the, you know, Kind of red tape barriers for for making sure that's you know somewhat uh, evenly distributed and doesn't just get heavily concentrated in, in public areas sure so um i can't speak too much to the possible planting areas question unfortunately um i was not involved with the uh preparation of the tree canopy assessment i know that possible planting area basically took into account um, currently green areas that are treeless. So it didn't take into account uh, impervious surfaces, for example. It, it only took into account green spaces that currently um, do not have trees. Um, with regards to your second question, the in lieu Fund wouldn't, uh, we're not proposing that it be used solely for replanting. Um, you know, one of the um, biggest things that I think we, that, that we're proposing to use it for is something that the community has actually been very vocal about, and that is acquiring, maintaining, and preserving um, existing wooded areas. So Bergsma is one right? Save Cougar Mountain. That was a big deal, right? Um, so city tree funds could be used for the acquisitions of property like that. Um, 
But you're absolutely right. We're completely aware of the fact that receiving sites and establishing those sites is going to be really important for replanting efforts. We know that we can't make commitments in the code um, for private landowners. So um, there, that that's why um, the tree fund right now outlines several um, uses for the tree fund. Yeah, that's super helpful. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, Dan. All right, and thank you, Commissioner Heights and Commissioner Milligan. You have the floor. Thank you, Chair Fall. This is Nina Milligan. Uh, thank you, Mr. Martinez. I have just a couple questions. Um, one is at the beginning of your talk, you mentioned how you expanded the um, fee and lieu program to more circumstances, and I don't remember that in the packet, so that went too fast for me. I need more information on that. Uh, and then when you're talking about the replanting within the sub area, um, also help me understand this a little better. Does this mean that if I want to remove trees from my property that brings the canopy below 35%, not the canopy, the um, is it? I thought we were doing canopy, but then you were just talking about calipers. So I think we might be talking about density. Am I going below 35% and planting a tree down the street somewhere? Is that what you're saying? And how does somebody get such a thing? Why would we approve that, uh, that they would go below the 35? So thank you. Just need to understand better. Sure. So with the tree and Lou, um, you know, I discussed it a little bit right now um you know we're, we're not proposing to use it ent entirely for replanting efforts and and what i meant by enhancing uh, was that in the current code the establishment of the tree fund is uh, not much more than a blurb um so we've been purposeful about um, which department is administering the uh, tree fund um, I'm in sorry. coordination. I wanna, I'm going to interrupt you just so that I can I can sure. say better what I meant to say. And I didn't say okay. who could participate in the tree and loof fund? Who is who is um, qualified to pay to cut down trees? And then uh, the other thing about 35. Sure, thank you for clarifying because I was clearly not going in the right direction. Um, the, the answer to that is that I, I look at it like mitigation sequencing, which is another chapter of the code, but you are, the first step is to plant on site um, where that's not feasible. Um, you know, I, I, I feel like I've been um, poked on this a little, but it, it's not always going to be feasible. We've also said that we want to uh, adopt a right tree, right place uh, approach. And sometimes when trees get removed, it's because they aren't in the right place. Um, so we recognize that offsite planning may have to occur. Um, that would be the second option. The third option would be this tree and loo, and now everybody would qualify, uh, provided that they cannot plant on site and they cannot plant off site. Um, it was previously only um, applied to development and redevelopment projects, but now it's been expanded to apply to um to already developed lots um and then just to clarify the 35 percent is that's um for our tree retention requirements and that applies to development and redevelopment and the off-site tree 
planting within the sub area is for those who are going below 35? No, it, it, it would, that would be for um, folks who cannot meet their tree canopy goals on their own site. Okay, and thank you very much, Commissioner Milligan and Commissioner Anderson. I just want to point out, though, uh, before we move forward, the time is 7.41, so we are starting to run a little bit behind. Uh, Commissioner Anderson, you have the floor. Okay, uh, thank you, Chair. This is Tom Anderson, Environmental Board. A few meetings back, we were reviewing uh, outdoor lighting um, uh, code, and uh, one of the things that came up there is that there is a bottle lighting ordinance uh, that's outside of uh, provided by a third party that uh, some municipalities are aligning with, and I guess we tried to align with that to some degree. I'm wondering, is there anything like that going on in the tree canopy uh, world where municipalities are uh, uh, taking aligned approaches to things, or is each municipality just going it alone. I guess, well, you did mention that we're trying to align with Lake City um, or Lake Forest Park uh, on, on some things. It just seems like the perfect sort of thing that we, we shouldn't all having to be reinventing this uh, each time that there should be some commonality across the, uni the municipalities. So is there anything like that going on? Uh, I'm not aware of anything like that. We worked with a consulting arborist um, who who made the recommendations. They're the ones who recommended that we look at Lake Forest Park and uh, Snohomish County uh, were the two examples that we were given to to look at. But we weren't made aware, nor did I find um, any kind of model ordinance. I think. Um, in, in this case, there's, you know, a, a bit of plagiarism <laughs> if it's, it's taking, uh, existing language and, um, existing ordinances that seem to be working, uh, and adapting it to, to our city. Well, plagiarism is good. Uh, you know, that's reuse. Reuse it should be all about reuse. So one more question. Um, so this this code is all about development and redevelopment and, and the regulations that apply specifically to those things. I'm wondering, is there somewhere else in the city code that affects uh, the homeowners uh, and developments that are not being developed, but uh, just providing incentive to uh, also address the overall, the high level uh, goal we have. We've established a goal. These, these codes are all about meeting that goal, but uh, then there's all this uh, installed base of uh, uh, housing and, and commercial. And uh, well, maybe with a little bit of education and help, uh, people can help us reach those goals by uh, improving their canopy coverage on their existing uh, structures. Now, I know that's that's something different than the, the code we're looking at here, but it, is there anything like that or anything like that envisioned in the uh, city code that you're aware of? Um, one of the, please tell me if, if I've misunderstood your question, but you know, I, I heard you mention incentives and uh, one of the questions that we received in the past was, um, you know, could if somebody plants uh, above their tree canopy coverage goals, um, will the city, um, you know, pay them? Um, I don't believe that there's anything. We're, we're not currently contemplating anything like that. Um, but I also heard you say talk a lot of uh, talk a little about education, and one of the um, proposed programs for the use of the city in Luffy's, uh, the tree in Luffy's, um, would be urban forestry education. So being able to um, either have staff or hire an outside consultant that um, can provide urban forestry education to, to the community. 
OK, good. Thank you. And thank you, uh, Commissioner Anderson, and I like your comment about plagiarism. <laughs> it's a great use. OK, so we're going to go ahead and take the last question here from Ann. Uh, Commissioner Newcomb, you have the floor. Thank you, Ann Newcomb here. Um, so I am wondering um, when a tree needs to be replaced, like if somebody takes one down, I didn't notice, is there a time frame? That they will have. I didn't notice any um, time time frame that they need to replace it in. Yeah, no, that's a great question, and I I never mean to imply that the other questions aren't great, but um, the there currently is not um, like a hard and fast deadline for replanting. Um, what we are proposing with this code is um, six months within the time of replanting is typically going to coincide with the approval of a permit. So at permit issuance, six months after that, you would be required to replant. The um, proposed, the draft code does uh, include language allowing um staff to extend that um to ensure that there are that the replanting is is occurring under the most optimal conditions great thank you and then one other quick quickie um i didn't notice lidar in your measurement uh plans is that something that you've thought about adding? It's not something that I've thought about adding. I'm, uh, I can't pretend to have, to have thought of that. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but it's absolutely something that's on my radar now. So, you know, we're, we're still exploring uh, the different tools that we'll be able to use both to um, measure existing and to project. Great, thank you. Okay, and thank you very much, um, uh, Commissioner Newcomb. And I did get a question here from uh, uh, Commissioner McWilliams. He would like to go ahead and make a quick comment or a quick question. Yeah, sorry, I was on the wrong comment channel there, so you didn't see my earlier question. My question is about your heritage trees. Um, who's determining the heritage trees? Do you have an arborist on staff that's doing that? And then my other question is, what prohibits folks from removing trees over time? So if you're a resident, I remove a tree this year, and then another one two years, and another one two years. What prohibits me from removing all the trees on my lawn? Sure. So for the first question, there is um, no heritage tree regulations. They're mentioned in the existing code. Um, and we we don't have an arborist on staff that would go out and say this is a heritage tree the the heritage tree program is um largely as i understand it um something that uh, a resident could nominate a tree to become a heritage tree um, based on certain factors um so, so one of the, the questions for discussion was hopefully, you know, should we be uh, adopting um, that process into our code, that nomination process? And um, so, th so that's one. Uh, your second question, I'm sorry, could you repeat it? about tree removal over time so can i remove a tree today another one in a year another one a year after that eventually remove all the trees off of my property the, the short answer is no uh you would need right now tree removal without a, uh, let me clarify significant trees so a tree that measures six inches um in diameter at breast height is considered a 
significant tree. Uh, if you would like to remove any significant trees on your property or any tree period within a critical area, you will need a tree removal permit. Um, one of the questions that we were asked was on policing. Um, we don't, we, we rely largely on um, notification from the public. Um, my neighbor's cutting down a tree, do they have a permit? Um, but we are not actively um, patrolling to see if people are cutting down trees. Okay, and thank you, uh, Commissioner McWilliams. And so that concludes it for our questions uh, tonight on this topic. Uh, with that said, let's go ahead and open it up to public comment. Stephen, do we have any members from the public that would like to speak tonight on this topic? Yes, I see a few raised hands and I have received a comment from Dave Kapler who would like to comment and Dave, I'm going to unmute you now and make you a panelist. Hey, um, great, thank you. Um, I've been fighting for trees actually since 1973 when it, and, um, and on a big scale that whole for most of those 50 years. But at the same time, I've got a solar on my house here in downtown Issaquah, and I got a very large garden. And uh, tree canopy already impacts both of those um, because of actually trees off of my property. But um, I, th I think we want to make sure we're not um, eliminating people's ability to have solar, which in our case, we have a surplus each year of electricity. We Beyond making a running one, a one car that's electric, and um, most of our, except for our gas furnace, admittedly, and our gas hot water, um, we produce enough electricity to cover all of that. So we also have a huge garden, which we donate quite a bit of produce to nonprofit groups beyond what needs our own needs. So um, tree canopy would um, potentially could uh, uh, really impact that. What I want away is not. I want to see how we can. Um, have ways for people to be planting trees or supporting trees in other places, or perhaps uh, a community solar. So my transfer of the solar generation could uh, could uh, be more of a common kind of thing that somehow would work. But um, let's um, let's make sure we um, figure those out because certainly for climate, uh, trees are very important. But so is um, not being dependent upon. Uh, coal burned in uh, Wyoming or Montana. Uh, thank you. Okay, I see four more raised hands. And starting with uh, Connie, I'm gonna unmute you now and make you a panelist. Hi, Connie Marsh again. Um, as I recall, there is a solar exemption in there. Uh, but so the heritage, the heritage tree thing has been sort of sitting, burbling, not doing much for years and years. And I think it it's supposed to rely with the park board who is here, but the park board is never really activated very much on it. Now, that whole large stand of trees on Newport Way in front of Tibbetts Valley Park, I, I, I think it's not a heritage tree. But what it is, is it's a it's a, a grouping of trees that are superior and their place making in town and something that should not be lost. So our public works department right now in this code has the ability to pretty much take down trees and they're e exempt from trying to say they can replant. That's very loose. But for trees like that, along that corridor, we need some recognition that these are more than just a standard street tree. And we need to create um, a, a list, a map, something that protects these trees. Now, they may 
have to go in the end, but they should have to go through a large public process where the people can say that these are the important trees and we don't want them down or they aren't so important and we can we can do something else. And and that is really missing from the code. And if we let the code go forward this way without those protections, some of our larger, more important trees are going to fall by the wayside because of projects that the city itself is doing, not really as much as private development, though some will fall for that. So I would encourage you to say that we do need to to protect these better trees in our system and figure out how to do that. Um, the tracking of trees and what's happening and if we're gaining our canopy, I think is super important because remember, we're planting these trees and we're counting on that canopy to be mature in 30 years. It's not like we have the canopy now. And so if people are planting their trees, and we're saying you can have these impacts or do these things because in 30 years you're going to have a canopy. If we don't measure those trees or in some way track them, they will be gone and we will have allowed this impact without surety that we are actually going to get the canopy that we are aiming for. And so I, I think a traffic a tracking mechanism is 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 it's going to cost some money, but it's the only way that we're going to get to our goals. You get what you measure, right? If you don't measure it, you aren't going to get it. So I want to compliment that this was by far the easiest piece of code that I could read. And so I really appreciate, I could almost relax while reading this code because I didn't have to fight seemingly contradictory language. I just got to waffle on the themes. Thank you. Okay, we have we have Mary Lynch with her raised hand. Mary, I'm gonna unmute you and make you a panelist. Okay, this this is Mary Lynch. I just want to um, support what Connie said because I've already experienced out on Newport Way where with public works projects or the widening of Newport Way, which is actually done with developers. Um, but because it was in the public uh, right away, the city did not uh, account for any of the mature trees that were cut down. And these were mature trees, not only that presented some significance as far as canopy, but also for shade for houses. And so last summer, those houses that normally would have been protected um, had no shade. And there there was no accounting for where these were going to, you know, no mitigation um, for them. And we see substantially um, trees along Newport Way as we ever get the funding to widen it, that again, those trees are going to go away and there's nothing in the code to assure that that gets put back in the canopy or mitigated in any way and street most of the street trees that the city has designed really don't count for a lot of canopy and most of the trees that they selected like along maple a lot of the life uh, of those trees are very short so i think when we're looking at we need to protect trees that are on public um or you know taken away by public works projects and where we can't not take them away Specifically, as Connie said, those um, sycamores that are along Tibbetts Field, I mean, those are just, it's just a statement there and everybody refers to it. And for those to go away because Public Works wants a project there, I don't think is is something we should allow to happen or happen. And we need to protect those trees going forward. Also, we need along streams, uh, anti-aircraft creek. Some trees came down and the city replanted but there's no accountability. The city's come back in and redone that stream now three times since the first was done. And the trees that were planted at the first replanting have now been taken out. And I've asked the city who's going to come back and replant that. There's there's no um, no accountability for it. And so now we have just a parking lot area next to anti-aircraft creek 
where um, there were supposed to be trees there within the buffer zone and there are none. So the city needs to be held accountable on their public works projects to protect trees, to mitigate trees, and then to account for trees. And as Connie mentioned, um, I've seen that the city really doesn't have a good way of tracking when in a permit they say you're supposed to replant. No one comes out and checks to make sure that it's replanted. So we need in the code to have that tracking and the city needs to fund someone to actually come out and make sure that it happens because it has not happened over the years. Thank you. Okay, we have Ann Fletcher next, and I'm going to unmute you now and make you a panelist. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, Great. we can. Thank you. I'm Ann Fletcher. I'm a resident in uh, People for Climate Action Issaquah Chapter. I, I just first want to thank all the boards and commissions and the staff for the heavy work that's been going on on Title 18 Natural Environment. Um, clearly, improvements are being made. Uh, the big question for me and for People for Climate Action are the code strong enough? to meet crucial environmental and climate goals that the city has adopted within the next decade even. Overall oversight and tracking, the code needs to help our system, which needs to improve. And I think you've heard that from several other people. But to ensure the needed strength, I would like to see in the code built-in requirements for measurement, monitoring, and adjustment. This is the tracking that Daniel brought up and other people have brought up. Uh, this is often left to various city department plans. However, plans, administrations, departments, and staff come and go. Also, the plans need to be modified as new information becomes available. And this is where we need to improve. Code is a common thread over time to which everyone must attend. It should include instructions on best practices that enable the implementation for this to really happen. At an open house on Tuesday, I learned that this code, proposed code, does not ensure these mechanisms. Now, this code would require or could require reallocation or additional resources as, pe as people have brought up. Yet, community members are here to let boards, commissions, and council know that what our priorities are so that the budget may reflect them. So, one of these priorities is having code that requires these tracking mechanisms. Now we're not talking about amenities here, we're talking about real consequences to basic health and safety. The best available science is telling us what we do in the next eight years could be crucial for our well-being. Council is the final determiner of whether these mechanisms should be in the code or not. When the council adopted the climate action plan, council members spoke to having the implementation work and having it really work in contrast to the past plans. I think they would be interested in a code that does just that. If they don't want to be tied to this code because it has budget implications, then that's their decision. But I think it should be presented to them as a possible way to meet their needs and the priorities of the community. That a specific example of this is the tree canopy code, which others have brought up, and I know you're short on time, so I'm not gonna go into that in detail, but you can see the connection with baseline, the trees we have now, replanting trees that are gonna take 30 years to become the same tree canopy that they are replacing. And the fact that we need that canopy sooner and how is that going to affect the 55%? If we're not tracking this, we're not going to reach that very important goal. So, I think that's all I have to say. Thank you very much.
Thank you, Anne. And then the last comment we have is from Steve. Steve, I'm going to unmute you now and make you a panelist. Okay, you're being moved over now. Okay. Yes, go ahead. Hi, this is Steve. Can you hear me okay? Yes, we can. Thank you. Steve, can you hear me? I'm going to send Steve a chat really quick uh, to let him know that we can hear him. So, Steve, if you can hear me, and I'll go ahead with your public comment. So anyway, my public comment is this. Uh, I don't want to repeat what I've already sent in because I don't want to take any more time than needed. Uh, several thoughts of people have spoken about this. Uh, one, I'd like to see some more verbiage or terminology added about the idea of what makes a project feasible and whether or not it's okay to remove or decide that only the developer can simply state it's not feasible and therefore have to remove all the trees or more trees than we would like. Uh, I would like to see some additional constraints placed on fee in lieu of so that we don't just remove old growth trees or trees that have carbon sequestration uh, and so we'll be able to pay the fee. Uh, third, I'd like to see more verbiage that talks about if they do do plantings, there's some bonding mechanism so that those trees that are replanted are nurtured and maintained and make sure that they're growing not just simply the replanting of the trees but there's some mechanism to track and make sure that those get maintained for more than three years because the the cost of the bonding is not just the cost of the tree refinement but it's the cost of the public benefit lost with those trees that do some functionality so i think that needs to be looked at further uh, i think that we need to look at tree canopy both as something in a prescriptive terms that most people don't understand canopy, they understand I'm allowed to keep X number of trees and that's how they relate to this. I also think we need to look at trees from an ecosystem perspective, not just a canopy perspective. Uh, especially along rivers and streams and that type of thing. So we're not just looking at the water quality, but the whole ecosystem that's provided with that and so I think that needs some broader that so we're not just moving any existing standards forward, but we're, looking, we're asking what types of standards to be implemented to better make the same numbers. Thank you for time. Thank you. That's it Great. for me for now. Great. Thank you, Steve. Chair Fall, that is all the public comment. Okay, and thank you very much, uh, Stephen, for public comment. And we're going to go ahead and move this over to uh, Commissioner Comments. And so, uh, uh, Chair Book, would you like to go ahead and uh, take over from here for deliberations? <clears throat> okay, thank you. Commissioner Fall. Um, it's time for comments from the Park Board members and Environmental Board members that are present. Uh, please uh, put the drop down at everyone and put in that you have a comment and I will call upon you. And um, first comment, actually I'm going to ask a question to Danielle since she put in some text here as a comment. Danielle, would you like me to read this or do you, do you want me to read this about heritage trees? Oh, I'm happy to just explain it. So one of the things that the park board does is serves as um, as a tree board every, it's, I think we're supposed to be doing it like every year. Um, and that's in connection with Issaquah being a tree city, USA city. And um, those heritage trees are 
nominated by either members of the public or um, or city staff, or we used to have an arborist who would do it, um, and then are designated as heritage trees. Um, my understanding is that those heritage trees, as current in their um, currently, the designation as a heritage tree does not preclude that tree from being removed at a later date. So it's not a permanent designation. Um, but that's just I just wanted to throw that in the chat, just since there seemed to be a question about heritage trees. Thank you, Danielle. <clears throat> Next, we have a comment from Don McGillians from the Environmental Board. Go ahead, Don. Hi, Don McWilliams from the Environmental Board. So two comments. Um, first off, to, to staff, I would encourage you to look for a arborist certification for your arborists that you're hiring out there or that are signing off on these plans. You can look to City of Kirkland has a good example of that where they have to go through a training course to learn your code before they can actually work for the city or be representatives of the developer. And then a uh, comment about you guys not having an arborist. I'm kind of disturbed by that. You've been a tree city since the early 90s. And if I heard it right, you don't have an arborist or a city forester on staff. So who's managing the trees in Issaquah? So I don't expect you to answer that. I would encourage the boards and the staff to raise that issue and uh, be proponents for hiring an arborist in the future in the next budget cycle or so. That's all. Thank you. Thank you, Don. The next comment is from uh, Dan uh, from the Environmental Board. Go ahead, Dan. Thanks, Brad. Uh, Dan Hintz, Environmental Board. I'll just quickly amplify Don's comments. That was definitely one thing I wanted to mention. I mean, it seems like Having an arborist on staff would be a priority. I think that certainly ties into some of these desires around some more of the on the ground tracking. So for me, the tracking, there's the kind of high level airplane view. And I definitely want to kind of amplify and Newcomb's comment earlier about LIDAR being a really, really good tool for, uh, you know, both tree canopy coverage, but also tree canopy height. You can get some really, really neat data, which speaks, you know, to carbon sequestration and other, you know, environmental benefits of canopy that, you know, big difference between 10 foot tall trees and 100 plus foot tall trees. So I think there's really neat opportunities there. And then yes, having someone on the ground that's maybe a little bit more accountable for tracking uh, the success of these trees plantings, how the uh, tree mitigation fund will be spent and used. And um, I think as Connie mentioned in some of her comments, you know, what what, what is maintenance of these tree replantings look like? Who's accountable for for, you know, kind of trying to follow up on that? Um, two more, hopefully quick comments, uh, on the, um, preferred or the, the master tree list. I know, I think Daniel mentioned that that's going to be updated. I won't go in to start listing the half dozen or so trees on the preferred list that I don't think should be on the preferred list. Um, I would be honored and super happy to chat or consult on that when that gets updated. For instance, Norway maple is on both the preferred and non-preferred list currently. So there's some discrepancies some things that I think could be considered to remove from the preferred list. I'd be considered if there would be a little bit more strength to the non-preferred list versus being recommended not to use versus actually being uh, you know, disallowed to be used in, in replanting efforts throughout the city. So I think there's a lot of potential there and it's exciting to hear that that should be moving forward and, and very much a volunteer help on that. Um, if, if that there'd be interest there. Uh, the last thing I'll say that I know has come up some too is, you know, I've, I've been trying to read, uh, you know, a little bit more about the, the trunk method for uh, valuation of trees. I'm assuming that will inform some of the costs that go into these funds, uh, the in lieu funds. Um, my best understanding is it is valuing current trees, you know, based on size, location, species, condition. It doesn't really have the temporal value or the temporal loss of a tree that gets cut down today and replaced, you know, as we, I've heard a lot of 30 year comments on here from Connie and Ann, and I would say, especially for our conifers, we're talking 50 to 100 years before we're really regaining some of those values around uh, carbon storage around rain interception, air pollution. So uh, I, I would even argue there's a, there's a longer time frame before we're recouping some of those uh, benefits of replanted trees from trees lost. So uh, I don't know. The trunk method seems solid. I, I'm really curious to learn more about it, but I, I feel like it still doesn't uh, incorporate that um, time loss uh, value of tree cut down versus tree planted today. That's you know 30, 50, or 100 years from maturity. So um, yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you for that, Dan. And next we have a comment from Tom Anderson. Go ahead, Tom. 
Uh, thank you, Chair Book, Tom Anderson, Environmental Board. Um, uh, so I know this is apart from development. This code is all about uh, development and redevelopment. And uh, it is my my feeling, though, that to um, uh, there, need, there needs to be a public education element to this to accomplish our overall goals that we're striving for. Uh, and uh, so somewhere in the city's program, public education to teach people that trees are our friends for a variety of reasons. Um, uh, uh, related to climate change and other things and uh, help people um, improve their canopy coverage uh, to get with the program. And this is needs to be a part of the overall strategy. It's not the strategy, it's just part of the overall strategy and just focusing on development and redevelopment uh, won't get us there. Thank you, that's all I had. Thank you for that comment, Tom. Uh, next up from the Environmental Board, uh, we have a comment from Nancy Davidson. Go ahead, Nancy. Thank you very much, um, Nancy Davidson, Environmental Board. You know, in the ICAP, the city set a goal of getting to 55% of total Issaquah acreage covered by tree canopy by 2035, which is a pretty ambitious goal, and it's something that we're really working hard to try and achieve. But it's apparent that the mature trees that we have in our community can't be replaced with trees that will only provide that kind of same coverage in uh, 30, 40, or 80 years, as Dan mentioned earlier. So we need to find a way to increase that canopy if we're cutting down a tree in a more um, quick fashion. But one of the things that I think is really important is tracking how, how many trees are removed and how many trees are planted. And the reason I say that is it's pretty easy to say that let's remove a tree from a park or a tree from a public right of way, but we need to make sure that every time we remove a tree, we're tracking it so we can track how we're doing to achieving our ICAP goal, which is the climate action plan goal set by the city and the, and the council. So I would encourage us to really be looking at um, trying to track that as stated by others and that we're really trying to find a way to increase our coverage of the canopy, not just the number of trees. That's it, thank you. Thank you for that, Nancy. Um, I'm gonna just quickly read a little comment from Jeff Watling here. LIDAR was used during recent tree canopy study and was very instructive and beneficial in that work. Um, just a little experiential uh, thing here that supports uh, earlier comments about LIDAR and its advantages. Uh, next, we have a, a quick question from Danielle Githens from the Park Board. Go ahead, Danielle. No, you can skip me. I'm gonna um, follow up directly with staff, thanks. Okay, thanks, Danielle. Uh, looks like that concludes, I'm gonna just add one thing, time is short. Um, I would like for us to continue on here uh, until we conclude this this evening. Um, I'll leave that up to Ron. Uh, my only comment just to support everybody is tracking, 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 accountability, accountability, accountability. You know, you can have a whole bunch of codes written up, but if you don't keep people accountable for them, they're, not, they're fairly meaningless. Uh, I, th I think that there needs to be a good strategy in place for accountability and follow up on these issues and especially with uh, tree contractors who are going to be primarily doing a lot of the uh, tree removals um, i think that that concludes everything from the park board and uh, environmental board so back to you commissioner fall all right thank you very much uh, uh, chair brook so with that said, I'm, I am going to go ahead and make a quick comment on uh, what uh, Chair Book just simply said. We had several trees removed recently because one of them was over our sewer line, it had tree roots in the sewer line itself. The tree company came back and said the city doesn't bother about checking trees. We'll cut them down. Don't worry about it. Leave it up to us. So with that said, there's the accountability problem. I have a real case scenario. It does exist. Uh, with that said, uh, Stephen, the floor is yours for presentation. We are at 8.20, so if people need to leave at 8.30, I certainly understand. We need to keep questions to a minimum and comments as well. So with that said, please be sensitive to the time. And uh, Stephen, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you. I'm going to turn it over to Katie, uh, who 
I am going to give you presenting rights now. Thank you. Okay, go ahead and share your screen. Okay. Thank you. I'm going to attempt to be really quick. So sorry if I'm talking fast, um, but I want to respect everyone's time. So for the landscape code, the idea with this code was not to make major changes to the way that landscape is uh, required through Title 18 and through cent the central standards and the replacement regulations, but to put them all into one consolidated place. Um, we also wanted to um, incorporate some sustainability measures through landscape planting standards and irriga uh, irrigation standards um, and keeping to the goal of maintaining neighborhood charm and distinctive characters. So key changes, we've made some changes to recommended um, plant type, plant species to encourage plant diversity and native and drought tolerant species and pollinators. Um, that was a response to public comment that requested those types of plants be encouraged or required. Um, there's also updated standards for irrigation to encourage uh, water water resource conservation uh, and also some additional standards for tree planting to encourage healthier trees uh, that we decided to leave that in the landscape code rather than in the tree preservation code. Um, and like I said, we consolidated the various parts of the code that dealt with landscape into one place and then we moved some sections like tree preservation that had been together with landscape into its own chapter move some other things like fencing that will go in a different chapter as well. Uh, at the at the initial meeting we had with the PPC, um, we discussed creating a separate landscape standards document where the kind of the nuts and bolts of the landscape technical standards would be located outside of Title 18. Uh, after public comment and comment from boards, we did not do that. And that was a, a last minute change that we um, reincorporated everything back into Title 18, so there's not going to be a separate landscape standards document. So this is an example that builds on the community space, um, the community space concept. Uh, I'm not going to spend a lot of time here, but I did want to point out this is a non-residential building in central Issaquah. It would be required to have a community space um, and some landscaping um, as well as whatever the applicable tree regulations are. The community space, space with some seating and some, some canopy coverage. Uh, so we have received some comments on this chapter. Um, many of them surround that the, uh, the document or the chapter is difficult to understand and that there seem to be some internal inconsistencies. Uh, we've also identified some, some drafting errors uh, and some mistakes in this current draft. So we'll definitely be taking a really close look to make sure that it's internally consistent, that it doesn't have contradictory parts. Um, and if there's a way for us to rearrange the layout or add graphics to make it easier to understand, we're definitely going to prioritize re readability and usability. Uh, the standards themselves that we have in the code were not intended to majorly change. Um, one unintended consequence of the combining was the, um, the use of a landscape standard for border and frontage landscaping that applies to the non-central Issaquah areas um, that's uh, intended to separate unlike uses. And because it was a, the, this code applies it based on zone, it was inadvertently applied to some parts of central Issaquah that shared the same zone. So we'll be clarifying that that those, those types of standards that um, used to not apply in central Issaquah will continue not to apply in central Issaquah. Um, and, and we'll make that clear in the next round of revisions. So in our next steps, we're going to review the code, find inconsistencies and fix them, um, clarify where it's applicable, um, and then test the code and make sure that if, as planners apply it to projects, that it's working the way we intended it to and there's no conflicts. Okay, and Talking thank so you, uh, Planner Code. Is that concludes your presentation?
Very good. And so we'll go ahead and open it up to commissioner questions. Uh, again, remember sensitivity to time tonight. Uh, we don't want to go too far over here. Uh, so some people will need to uh, branch off. Uh, please open up for questions. So if you have questions, please post them in the chat. Okay, now we're not getting any questions. So <laughs> someone please speak a question if you have. Uh, it looks like Jason Voice is going to be the first person with a question. So great. Thanks, Jason. Saving the day. Here for you, Chair. So um, on page 3 of 25, Ms. Cote, it, it mentions the provisions of this chapter apply to all zone property. Um, I'm guessing, you know, obviously this has to do with landscaping. How does that actually work? I understand. Um, development, redevelopment, new development, redevelopment. What does all existing development mean? So it's intended to apply to um, development and redevelopment, similar to the other, um, to the previous chapter we discussed. Um, the, the term zoned property is, is basically referring to every property because every property is zoned property. So the intent is that it, it would apply everywhere, um, but it's not it's not required retrospectively, but it would be you don't need to come into compliance. But if you are um, redeveloping your site substantially or building a new development, you would be required to comply. Great, that was a little unclear for me. And then further down the page, it mentions there must be a diversity of tree and shrubs, uh, species in the site landscaping. I'm wondering who enforces this? Um, and I imagine this is also applicable to applicable to uh, new development and redevelopment, not necessarily retroactively. But who would enforce right. that? Yeah, is so that like a, a landscape permit. That's right. So. Um, a landscape plan is required with applications for certain types of development. And the landscape plan would show where landscaping is going and include a plant list and a planting plan. So the, the planner would review that to make sure that it had diversity and it met the planting separation standards and the soil standards in the landscape code. Okay, I think I think you clarified that with the first question. Is is again, it's not retroactive. This is mm -hmm. talking about new applications or or substantial uh, redevelopment of a lot. And then finally, a um, little bit of a concern, but it is a question. Uh, page eight of twenty five mentions um, allowing lawns to brown during the summer. And I know this is for water conservation, but my fear is, um, is there a concern with the city because? Um, you know, obviously letting lawns brown, we run the risk of allowing them to die. And then you're basically ripping up lawns, which I would imagine is exactly what we don't want to do. So I'm just, uh, I guess it's a concern, but I guess I really don't know how I'm trying to state it as a question so Ron doesn't get mad at me. Um, <laughs> but uh, um, so the, the the logic behind that is just what you said. It's a water conservation measure. Uh, lawns tend to do just fine if they go brown during the summer and then they get that fall rain and they come back over the winter. Um, I can speak from experience because my lawn goes brown every summer and it always comes back. But, you know, there is a chance that uh, in certain circumstances, a lawn that's not watered could die. Um, and, you know, I think that the city just decided that that they would propose this. This is a, I believe this is a new standard, uh, right. but it it contributed to some of the sustainability goals. Um, and it was something that other cities have, have done and it has been um, not unsuccessful, I should say. I don't know how successful it's been, but. I'm just, obviously I'm worried aesthetically what that looks like. And then, you know, not everybody's a green mm -hmm. thumb. So some people might sure. take it to the extreme. So I'm done, thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Voice. Uh, so I didn't mean to scare off everybody from not asking a question <laughs> because of time. Uh, being sensitive to time, 
if you have a question, please ask the question because this is a time in which it's really important to hear those questions. So um, are there any more questions? Because so far, Jason's the only person who's come forward with a question, and I want to make sure all the commissioners have a chance to have questions. So we'll give it a second here. Okay, crickets. And we got a question from uh, Commissioner Danielle. So, uh, or is yours? Yeah. So, my question is actually a follow up to the to the comment that was just made. And um, as I was reading that lawn browning section, I was wondering if if I was reading this correctly, that um, it means that does this mean that um, New developments that install lawn do not are not required to install irrigation with that lawn. Is that the? Am I reading that correctly? I'm not sure. I would have to look into that more closely. I don't know if if that okay. provision exempts irrigation. My, it just would not be turned on. Sorry. So I guess I read it that it would be exempt from installing irrigation and. I understand that there are times um, and maybe it's maybe in the future it will be all the time right that we um, need to be conserving water in the summer and it would not be appropriate to water lawns, but there um, are other times where it has been where we haven't been in that position and um, I would prefer to not give future developments just a blank um, ability to not install irrigation on grass. And I would prefer instead to ha say that, you know, there are times when it's okay to, um, you know, if there is a water shortage or other circumstances that um, that those lawns don't need to be watered. Um, especially with respect to common areas and, um, you know, communi community gathering spaces um, in neighborhoods. Thanks. And thank you, uh, Commissioner Githens. Uh, I think I agree with her on a point that may be based on community impact. So uh, we may want to change the code so that if it is a necessity for environmental community space, then maybe that would be irrigated, where if it's just a, an aesthetic purpose, then maybe not. Um, OK, so with that, let's go ahead and conclude it. I'm going to go ahead and open up to public comment. Uh, we do need to make public comments uh, rather short. If you do have additional or long questions, um, an email to the city staff would be uh, most appropriate. Stephen, uh, let's go ahead and open up for public comment. I see one raised hand. Um, Connie, I'm going to unmute you now and make you a panelist. Go ahead. So, Connie Marsh again. Um, the underlying basis for this code was we gathered it all together and because our old landscape code was working. Um, our old landscape code was not working and it was not usable for small businesses and it didn't scale up well for large businesses and it was a disincentive for people who had existing landscaping to maintain their landscaping. So I think we need to ask the basic question was, was that old landscape code good? And why, if it has issues, we should fix those issues. That seems to be the biggest problem that wasn't considered because I, I have people griping at me about their landscape stuff all the time. Thank you. And sure if I do not see any other raised hands for public comment. Okay, with that, we'll go ahead and close officially close public comment at 835. And we'll open up for um, uh, deliberations. And so, uh, Chair Brooke, would you like to go ahead and take over for deliberations? Hey, everyone, Park Board, Environmental Board. It's your last opportunity of the evening to make a few comments about uh, landscaping. So please uh, drop down everyone and um, make a comment or indicate that you want to make a comment, I'll call on you.
So given the Don McGillum, you have a comment. Go ahead, Dan. Thank you, Brad. Don McGillum's Environmental Board. I'll make it quick. Um, you mentioned in your goals that you want a nexus between landscaping and stormwater, and I just want to encourage you to look down that path. So we know today that um, 6 PPD, you may have heard of it, or 6 PPDQ is what's killing some of our coho salmon, and it can be treated with bioretention and or rain gardens for a simpler term. So I encourage you to get with your utility folks and better understanding how you can get the landscaping code in line with what you're doing um, with the stormwater management. Thank you. Thank you for that, Don. Next comment from the Environmental Board again, Nancy Davidson. Go ahead, Nancy. Thank you very much. And I would encourage you to, I agree with Don's comment. I was going to make that same one. In addition, uh, the code does require that um, a permanent efficient irrigation system installed in all landscapes except for single family lots. I'm not sure that's necessarily that or existing single family lots. I think that's something we need to think long and hard about if we really want permanent efficient irrigation systems on all of our properties. And I would also encourage us to really think long and hard about what kind of landscape areas we really want to have in our existing developments. I mean, we would like to retain some of what we have. And as a property redevelops, instead of having it tear out its existing landscaping, we want it to have to retain what it can, not just the trees, but some of the landscaping, the shrubs and other areas. So we need to really be thoughtful about that. And I'm not really seeing that in this chapter. That's my comment. Thank you. Thank you for that, Nancy. Uh, hi, Ann. We've got a next comment from uh, Ann Newcomb from Environmental Council. Go ahead, Ann. Hey, thanks, Brad. Um, Ann Newcomb here. Um, I always like to promote organic gardening practices. So if we could include that, that would be great. Um, I think everybody knows here that it's, you know, it's it's not just good for the soils. It's um, it's good for carbon sequestration. And then since we're talking about irrigation, um, just a reminder that we do talk about um, gray water uh, in the Climate Action Plan. So hopefully there will be more of that happening uh, using water that normally we um, use in our sinks. Um, and having it go out and water our plants. Thank you. Thank you, Ann. Not seeing any other comments from either board. So that concludes um, discussion from both boards. Uh, back to you, Commissioner Fall. Excellent. Thank you very much, uh, Chair Brooke. So we're going to go ahead and that concludes our presentations for the night. Um, we normally have reports, although because this is a shared uh, meeting tonight, uh, the rest of the board members can go ahead and uh, check off if they like. The reports are usually uh, based on PPC. So I will have a good night, everyone. If you're not on PPC, have a good night. If you're on PPC, stay on. Good night. And Stephen, let's go ahead and go into reports. Are there any reports for tonight? Uh, thank you, Trevor. We can keep it uh, really quick. Um, Minnie, do you do you have anything you want to? Uh, you know, um, real real quick, we did have a council uh, study session on the first uh, topic area of uh, natural environment, critical areas, and all that great work that all the boards and commissions did. Um, we ran out of time with the last meeting where you did the deliberation, so we're readjusting our schedule to come back to you. And at that time, we'll give you a longer briefing of uh, what the council said and what we're going to yeah, you know, incorporate in the first draft. So just wanted to put that, um, that we're shifting the whole schedule to accommodate additional uh, meeting uh, for that topic. Um, and at that time, we'll brief you on council's um, discussion on that topic. That's all I have. Okay. And uh, Stephen, anything, uh, any additional before we adjourn? Nope. Uh, the next meeting is April 14th, where PPC will deliberate and, and you'll receive all comments that have been received as part of the project for deliberations at, on April 14th.
Okay. Yeah, good point, what... Stephen. Real quick reminder. So the way the public comments are set up, I think there was maybe some confusion. So in your packet for today, we incorporated all the comments that we've received that informed the writing of the draft. So we've provided a more complete response to them. As the public hearing folds up, you know, we get comments towards the end. We were getting comments today and uh, at the public hearing. So we're going to consolidate all of those public comments and include them at your deliberation time frame. And then also for members of the public, if you're list if you're, you know, just so that uh, we were clear on, if you have comments that you want to send to Planning and Policy Commission, I think most of you do that you send them directly via email. Um, and those are the comments that we are going to incorporate in the table. If you have clarifying questions, we're happy to address it. Uh, you know, feel free to reach out to staff, me. Um, but it it gets a little uh, harder to track the questions from the official comments that come to Planning and Policy Commission. But we're doing our best. We want to hear anything and everything that anyone has to say. Uh, so keep those coming, and thank you for all your time. Thank you, Minnie. Uh, just a reminder, I'm not going to be here on the 14th, so Jason will be chairing the meeting. I already sent an email to uh, staff to let him know, but I just want to bring that up here. Um, I do want to bring up the amount of content to make it public here so it's on record. It's a little too much content. We had to speed through. I, the three topics were a bit much. We did get through, but uh, it was very rushed and I know comments are really important and I want the commissioners to be able to have an ample time to be able to say what they need to say without feeling like they're they are being rushed or the public being rushed. So um, my ask is that the city uh, work on reducing the amount of content that's presented during the meeting so that we can stay focused on um, the important topics that need to be discussed, uh, but I think it's too much. Um, so with that said, I'm going to let it go. Uh, meeting is 8.43. We're going to adjourn. So, um, oh, hang on a second. It looks like uh, Nina had a question here. Uh, Nina, go ahead. Never mind. It's just a meeting question. I'll ask Stephen later. Okay, very good. All right, so we're going to go ahead and adjourn at 8.43. Have a good night, everybody.